Shall we take a look at them, then? Right. Things like this are usually done through museums. Yes, but with the war coming, they couldn't embark upon any new ventures. Well, I've been on digs since I was old enough to hold a trowel. My father taught me. What are they? We're standing in someone's graveyard, I reckon. Viking? Well, maybe older. Mr Brown is an archaeologist. Well, I'm an excavator. You've come to dig up the mounds. So you think there's something beneath? Who are those men? They're from the museum. Ye gods! This is pretty. I think you'd better come and see. Why would anyone want to bury a ship? I'd expect this is a grave of a, a warrior or a king. But there's more. There's much more. War is looming. All hands are on deck to excavate before hostilities begin. The Dark Ages are no longer dark. Everyone's going to want a piece, and this is your find. Why else would you be playing around in the dirt while the rest of the country prepares for war? That means something, doesn't it? From the first human handprint on a cave wall, we're part of something continuous. Life is very fleeting. I've learned that. Would you have dinner with me? Yes. It has moments you should seize. A man could dig the earth his whole life through. Not find anything like I've discovered here. Steer it steady, Mr Brown. We're coming towards the edge of the atmosphere. You say the word, and I'll dig. I'm delighted to have our cast and crew here today. Um, Gabby Tanner, it's, you are the producer of the film. It's welcome. I wanted to start with you um, and ask you to tell us a little bit about um, the adaptation uh, from John Preston's book, Moira Buffini's adaptation. Can you set the scene for us a little? Moira, when I, when I got involved in the project, Moira had already done a beautiful screenplay, which um, was an inspired adaptation of John's wonderful book. And so it was, you know, it, it was a wonderful script to be able to garner the attention and excitement of talent. Um, so that worked out along down the road, but it still took a long time to get the film made. <laughs> And what was it about the project that you were really interested in? What's well, a remarkable story, a story that um, a lot of people growing up in England know because it's part of your primary history. Um, but, um, but it's such a surprising story. It's about ordinary people doing extraordinary things and people coming together to, um, to do something remarkable, which I think in these times is particularly resonant think and, and exciting to be able to sort of share this story now. And um, Simon Stone, can you talk about bringing him into the project? Why was Simon the right director for The Dig? Well, as soon as we sat down and talked to him about it, we knew because he just had an inspired vision of what it was. So um, we all knew his you know, theatre work um, and Ellie Wood actually brought him in because she'd worked with him um, on something before but he just was inspiring. He just came in and made us see a whole other dimension to the story. And Simon, can you just pick up on that a little bit? Um, when you came in and spoke to them about um, the story in the first instance, how did you describe what you wanted to achieve with the film? It was, <clears throat> it, it's been kind of strange looking at the world in the last year or, or, or nine months because it, 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 it's kind of slightly turned into, I feel as if we, unleashed a curse on the world by making the movie because I, um, I, I, I came to, to, to the, the original pitch meetings and I said it should feel like the world is on the edge of, 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 of civilization being uh, under threat to the extent that you don't know what the next five, ten years is going to bring and that that should be the reason that we uh, search for uh, and, and, and unearth and cherish the civilization that's gone before us. Um, uh, Rafe's uh, character 
mentions it in the backstory and it gets quoted back to him by his wife, played by Monica Dolan. She says, this is why you do this. This is why it's important because it's the thread that shows us who we used to be uh, and it gives us a sense of hope for the future. Um, it, that's what archaeology is. Um, and I said that, you know, it's so important that the threat of, the, uh, of some kind of um, imminent threat uh, and a sense of the world at a precipice um, it was really important to me to have that in every chapter of the movie. And, 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 and so we kind of brought that to the forefront in, in how we developed it since then. And, and I'm really glad we did now that we're living in the time we are um, because it's a film that we can share with people about the, the importance of community in, in uncertain times. The Daughter was your first film. This is your second feature film. It's a, in, in many ways, a big leap, huge cast, um, you know, incredible cast that you worked with as well too. Also big production on location. How much of a jump for that was you, for, was, was it for you in terms of production? It's always hard because the budget and the, and the, and the people that you're working with is always appropriate to the story that you want to tell. And if it's not, then the film shouldn't be being made. Um, so it's, it's always the steps up that you should be making. Um, and if, if not, then, then, then you're out of your depth. But I knew to a certain extent that, that, I mean, everything that all, I think all artists would say that, that their ability to be brilliant in any, um, circumstances based on their collaborators and, and the expectations that they and and the support that their collaborators give them, and to a certain extent also expectations that their collaborators have of them, it means you need to kind of rise to to the level of the people around you. And in that regard, I'm extraordinarily lucky in that I had um, people who you know couldn't be terrible if they tried um, in in you know in the lead roles. Um, and so you've got, you've, you've got a shorter distance to fall and you can take more risk creatively. You can be more courageous in your ideas because the, the sheer level of talent that's on the set um, and, you know, Mike Ely uh, as the cinematographer, Maria Jerkovic as the production designer, the list is endless, John Harris then in the editing room. I mean, I could be like a um, uh, completely um, inept, child uh, and they would have still made a great movie out of this uh, you know and my job was to, to 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 make it better than it would have been if I wasn't directing it. but that didn't mean that it was ever going to be bad and that's an incredibly privileged position to be in when directing something yeah your collaborators are tr truly wonderful and um Rafe tell us about Basil and uh, was it what, what hooked you into the story or into wanting to play Basil as a character well, Gabby passed me an early draft of the script some, yeah, maybe three or four years ago. I was very moved. I, I didn't really know the detail of the Sutton Who. I knew it was an Anglo-Saxon battleship excavated in England. I, I was pretty ignorant of any of the, the year it was excavated, and I certainly didn't know about Basil Brown and Edith Pretty, but I read, so my, I came to a deeper knowledge of the story through reading this, uh, the draft, uh, one of the earlier drafts, um, and I just found, I read it on an airplane and at the end of it, I was just in tears and I can't quite tell you why, but it's something to do about the integrity of the people unearthing this thing, which represents something to do with nationhood or who you are or what's in the earth and the people that are in the earth, the remains of people or, or the things that they held or used or carried or, um, and I think it's also, I, I guess something in me was also moved because I was born in Suffolk and I'm now reclaiming my Suffolk roots. I'm, I'm talking to you from Suffolk now with a, with a lithograph by a famous Suffolk artist above me. Uh, so that moved me too. Um, and I just thought that Moira Buffini's way of balancing the different characters and the relationships, it was never overly sentimental. It was all done with suggestion. It was, a, you know, act, we get to read screenplays and sometimes it can be a chore because the writing just doesn't lead you. And the director may be great and the act, actors that are, that are being proposed, but sometimes but this is a beautiful piece of screenwriting. So the combination of factors, I mean, um, 
And then um, I was excited when Gabby introduced me to Simon, who had um, was coming at it in, a, in an exciting way, unlike, I think, determined not to sort of produce, a, make a polite period film, but everything about Simon's direction was to sort of go round the corner of emotions or come to things from an interesting tangent and that's reflected in Mike's work, and and um, and so I was very excited. I, I felt that Simon would, in the best sense, shake it up, and and he was also uh, also, and it was a, a the greatest. Well, what the the, cra the crowning thrill was was learning that Carrie was going to play Mrs. Pretty. And Carrie, what was it about Edith that you uh, that attracted you to the character? Well, it, I mean, I suppose I came to the job in a kind of unconventional sense, but it wasn't really, if I'm honest, it wasn't Edith at the beginning. It was more the, it was more like, oh, <laughs> I get to act with Ray Fiennes. Fuck <laughs> 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 this stuff. So I just, before I'd sort of finished reading it, I was like, well, I'm definitely doing this. You know, it's <laughs> eight weeks with Rafe. Um, that's sort of, you know, getting to work with him was, just extraordinary and getting to watch him and you know so that was really like the the reason I was in pretty much straight off the bat and uh, and the script I found so moving and I remember reading the scene um where they discover that it's a ship and at the end of that scene um when they're sort of she's holding her son and just whispers to him it's a ship and I just oh just completely knocked me for six and I just knew that it was going to be um that was going to be a really important moment and and i and i knew of simon um as a theater director and obviously how exciting um he was and and people raved about him i hadn't seen uh, the daughter um but then i did watch the daughter and i was like oh he's not gonna fuck this up this is great <laughs> sorry am i allowed to swear um, <laughs> Oh, he's gonna do, he's gonna do he's gonna make this he's gonna you know make this beautiful script which in in one direction could be it would be hard pressed to be, but there's a version of it that does feel safe and like something that we understand and we've seen before. And I think I knew that Simon wouldn't do that. And I certainly wasn't interested in, you know, I've, I've done lots of period things and I think, you know, I've kind of tried hard to not be, you know, pigeonholed in the past and suggesting period, but this was sort of too good an opportunity to pass up getting to, so really coming to Edith sort of happened later for me. It was like, the, it was actually the co collaboration with Simon and Rafe and Gabby and knowing the team that they were building. And then, you know, knowing that Lily and Johnny were involved and I came on, you know, so it was really like the most beautiful, um, exciting. Um, you and Rafe uh, share some incredible scenes. They're so intimate. And I was just struck by how refreshing and rare it is to get to see a male and female character on screen who share this kind of intimacy that where you approach um, the scenes as equals, or both outsiders, um, but it being that intimacy not being about romance, but it being about a, a sort of life of the mind. How, how unusual did that feel to the two of you as actors to get to play those scenes together? Uh, well, I, that was one of the, what you've described is one of the things that moved me because it was a, depicted this, as you say, a, a, a attractions of minds and a, a common sense of purpose. And I think there is, I mean, I just thought it was so beautifully judged about how it's possible to have a sort of, if you like, an intellectual intimacy or closeness or proximity to someone. And that bond can be almost as powerful as a romantic bond. Um, and there's no question, I think, that there would ever, ever cross over. It's just, it's just when two people can have pr profound respect for each other. And it's profound. It's not just polite respect. It's, it's, it's when two people see, see each other. You see the other for who they are and you feel seen. And I think Basil feels seen by Edith. And I think probably she feels, I don't know, but I feel that there's that instinct is an intuitive understanding of each other and I thought that was very moving on the page and and certainly working with Carrie it was it was a thrill it was a thrill to work with her and her incredible natural ease and sort of un, just beautiful things that she was sending towards me and and then Simon also nurturing us 
with some of the most wonderfully light but deft but telling direction and notes, which was, it's so lovely to feel that you're being watched as an actor and the director just comes in with that sort of a little tiny thing that just fires off something in your brain. Um, and Simon doesn't go into long kind of, uh, you know, some directors can sort of be, go on, go on a bit and you want to say, yeah, you're just telling me to be faster. <laughs> <laughs> And Simon does, but it's wonderful when you're given a little creative idea. Um, and so, and I think, uh, yeah, those, those, sorry, I'm going on a bit now, but it was those, those scenes and having to play them with Carrie is one of the great delights of it. And Carrie, what was your, what, how did Simon work with you and Rafe on those scenes? There's a great calibration of the relationship developing. I think, you know, like all well-written characters, you, allow each other to develop and grow and you're such unique characters how did how did you talk about um that those that character that joint character arc together with Simon a lot of our chats were about the you know this isolation that she's living in and um and not having anybody of her uh on her level that she can be open with or have any kind of vulnerability with and there's nobody that she can share anything with in her life. She can't share her fear or her vulnerability with her son. She certainly can't do it with her staff as much as she, you know, likes and I'm sure loves them. There's, she's of an era where there are boundaries and she has lots of boundaries and she has lots of lines that she's drawn to kind of keep her composure when I'm sure she probably doesn't want to. Um, but there's something about Rafe's character that kind of, he there's a sort of direct line between the two of them um, and, and and not without a little bit of conflict. And I think that was, mm -hmm. you know, a nice, um, that it wasn't an, it wasn't a sort of instant thing between the two of them. It sort of goes through these moments of conflict and, and stubbornness and they kind of spar against each other a little bit. And, but I think in those scenes, what I felt more than anything was there was just space it just always felt like we were allowed space and we were allowed time and there was no rush and it, you know between in the scenes with just Rafe and I it was about kind of because it's about two people who get to the place where they can sit in silence together it's that kind of intimacy and they don't need to talk and I think you know for that to work even in acting it needs to be a time where you actually can sit in silence and not have to rush so Simon was very good at creating that space to just let the two of them like be together Simon, it, they, it, all the performances are, are really beautiful. And, and like you said, you're working with some real world class actors here. But um, it's also a film that's incredibly cinematic. Um, and it, I just wondered, it's a, it's a, it feels like an unusual period film in some ways because there's a sort of naturalism. Um, I, I heard you say that, um, that you allowed long takes like a documentary and there is this sort of um, naturalistic quality that feels really freshing and, and fresh for a period piece. How early did you have this, um, this pace and this sort of texture in, in your mind? From the beginning really, because I, when I read the script, um, I had a very similar, I was on a, a Eurostar, not a plane, um, but I had a very similar experience to, to Rafe where I was crying by the end. And, I, and it felt all the more shocking because it was so unexpected. I don't have any um, kind of predilection for archeological or histor historical stories. It was, it, was, it was actually more saw the pitch I'm, I'm working with Ellie, I'm a friend of Ellie's. I hadn't even met Gabby at that point in time. Um, uh, I guess I should finish this, um, even though the pitch doesn't, you know, the, you know, the three liner doesn't seem really that interesting to me. Then I read this thing and because it was so surprisingly moving, it was a page turner, I couldn't put it down. I, it's very rare to read a script that you just don't want to stop at all. Um, I thought to myself, the film, the, the film needs to be watched like that. And any sense of, 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 of composition or framing or, or world building that undermines the immediacy of the surprise of people falling in love uh, as an audience as well with the, with the fabric of, of this adventure um, would, would not allow the audience to transcend the, their own expectations of, of the subject matter. Um, and I, so I was immediately 
I was immediately from the beginning trying to push for this idea of if you can be with the characters and their experiences and their shock, um, that they're suddenly a part of history. Nobody wakes up in the morning and thinks that they're going to be a part of history. Um, and so often when, when historical movies are made about a very important moment that already at the beginning are telling you that, this, that, that all the characters already know that they're going to be a part of history, um, particularly in this, in this story where, where you've got two characters that were, who, you know, one of whom, uh, Edith, has an inkling and would like it to be so, but is also full of a huge amount of self-doubt in, in regards to that inkling. She, you know, she uh, sways between defending herself and then, and then also realising that maybe this is absurd. And the other who, who never expected that, he, you know, Basil never expected that he was going to be in the history books and he's proven right ultimately. And that's only been changed in the last few years where he's been given the due that he's been given. But that film can't be made with these two unpredictable leads. It can't be made in the way that you would make a movie where you go, well, important things are happening, everyone knows it, and we're gonna and we're gonna film it like that. It needs to feel awkward, accidental, and found. As I was watching it, I was thinking that um, the UK doesn't make films like this right now. I mean, it's sort of, um, but but then I started thinking, ha have we ever? And I wondered if there were sort of cinematic references. I, I did think a little of someone like Peter Weir and the way he approaches these huge epic stories that are also so intimate. Did you have any any sort of reference points as a film fan? Abs you know, absolutely. I mean, Peter's, Peter's a, a great reference. Um, uh, Terence Malick's early work was a huge reference uh, for me, especially the stuff that was historical because he, he managed to make a lot of those films set in other eras feel like they were contemporary movies as well uh, in an exciting way. Um, the, the cinema of, 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 of the Soviet Union from the 20s to, to you know, um, uh, Perestroika basically was a huge huge inspiration to me because it's often a cinema about the relationship between humans and their landscape. And it, it didn't shy away from the idea, you know, because it was often making propaganda. Uh, uh, if you look at the, you know, Dovchenko movies or the Kalatozov movies, they're, they're often engaging in what is the human spirit as a, as a collective. Um, and I, so in some ways I kind of perversely kept telling my, my um, uh, British collaborators, I want to make a piece of Soviet propaganda, um, but um, uh, for it to feel historically uh, uh, realistic as well. Um, and a lot of those movies, if you go and look at them, um, Russian, Czech, Ukrainian, uh, and various films from the Caucasus, you know, from the 30s to the 60s, have an aesthetic that's very similar to this. It's kind of got an epic aesthetic, uh, very wide angle lenses, lots of landscapes, uh, but wide angle lenses on people's faces, which is often not um, something that people think well, you can get away with, but we, we managed to back turn that into something beautiful for the actors as well. Um, but also that a human is always a, a, a slave to their context. Um, and so much of the story is about that Edith and Basil are, are, are still enchained in their context. Um, uh, and so it felt like an inevitable style to, 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 to go for. And Gabby, is that the pitch you took to the financiers, the <laughs> so making the Soviet uh, film? Well, how difficult it was it for you guys? at the beginning. <laughs> how difficult was this for you guys to get made or not? Um, it was very challenging. It was yeah. very challenging to actually, you know, make it in the way that we wanted to make it. Um, you know, it wasn't... You know, to make a film at a certain level of budget is always challenging, even if you have the best people involved. And a lot of people felt there was another way to make it and that we could do it for less. But, you know, there was no way that we could. Um, there was no way you could shoot this film in five weeks or six weeks, you know, we needed it. Right needed. So it was, um, it, it, but, but we got there, but it was, we, we had to, say no to a bunch of different financiers because they just weren't going to let it be made the way that we felt it had to be made. 
And Kerry, uh, we spoke about your scenes with Rafe, which are beautiful, but also the scenes with Lily's char character, Peggy, are also really wonderful. And again, um, this great sort of female, um, you know, ally that Edith has in, in the film. How, um, how, much, how much did you enjoy playing those scenes? Did you and Lily enjoy playing those scenes together? It's so nice to talk to another woman on camera. <laughs> it just doesn't, have, like truly, truly doesn't happen very much. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it's so great to get to act with women in general. Um, and Lily's so wonderful and I loved how she played, um, the character and it was nice to have that kind of sisterhood in there. And she's, she's, you know, she's, what I love about her is she's down, she's doing all the things that Edith would do if, if, if conventions and her, phys, and her physical, you know, her body would let her, I think Edith wants to be down, you know, in the dirt digging. And she can't because she's not well and because she could never do that. She could never roll her dress up and get down there. So there's a real kinship there because she's she's watching a version of herself, I think. It looks like it, it, we, Simon and I spoke about the sort of uh, the naturalism of the way he's filmed it, but it also looks um, the performances have an incredible naturalism. It looks like he cultivated the kind of set where you could um, have that space to work with other actors. How much did you all as actors, Rafe and Kerry, um, rehearse or was that, uh, did he give you time to do that on camera? Um, was it an extensive rehearsal process? Rafe? I think we rehearsed a bit. Um, I don't remember being, I felt it felt like a healthy amount of, I remember the rehearsal on the, the first scene we have going out to the the mounds and we walked and rehearsed and we, I, I, I felt, I mean, I think it's a skill knowing how much to rehearse, I think, for films because you can easily over rehearse and then you've sort of spent, you, you, you know, you think the thing you have to give has been given in rehearsal. So I, I felt Simon managed just, it was to get the feel of something, the shape of something and then to shoot it. Because, I mean, actually, I remember years ago when I did Schindler's List, Steven Spielberg very quickly said, OK, we'll rehearse on film. He just wanted to shoot film as soon as the actors were ready to do something, just to see he might get something. And I think there's a real value in just getting a shape and then rolling film or digital or whatever, but to get stuff down early. But I, I felt it was... I don't know, it felt everything about the way Simon managed us as actors or allowed us as actors felt it, it as Carrie said earlier we felt we I was given we were given space um, Simon can I just ask you um your your heads of department are incredible too you've spoken about Maria and also Mike um in particular those two and on set um how how did you three communicate about what kind of look that you wanted did um I've, I've read Maria brings books and color palettes and um was that part of your process on, on this film as well too Absolutely. And that's why, you know, I, I love the idea of working with Maria from, the, you know, I, I was a huge fan of hers before, you know, that the idea that she and she actually came attached to the project um, uh, uh, before I was even on it. So it was it was a huge privilege for me to, to then kind of go, oh, my God, I don't even have to convince, um, my, you know, my favorite production designer. You know, all of the interiors and the color palette, all of that stuff that, that Maria can do with her eyes closed. The, the big challenge here, uh, and thank God we had someone who can really think outside the box, was how, how on earth do you represent these, this, this, this ship, this Anglo-Saxon ship? How on earth do you shoot it? How, how, do you, how do you find, first of all, a field which can't be the original field because that's been turned into a, 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 a tourist uh, um, venture. You know, it's 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 a it's it, it is it has been you know the actual Sutton who has been made um, uh, you know capable of receiving you know thousands of, of people a week, um, which obviously our field was a virgin field. Nobody knew that it was going to turn into what it was. Uh, finding the field. Building, you know, you know, building all of these burial mounds because it was a larger Anglo-Saxon Saxon burial uh, uh, area. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the one. Uh, and how do you 
shoot something that is incredibly fragile, so fragile that it actually doesn't even have any substance, um, and have people dig in it and bury it, and then uh, in, in what stages? That was the hugely different, and you know, with Mike as well, it's like, when can we shoot, which sections can we shoot forwards? And then when do we have to jump backwards again? Or when do we have to jump forward? Do, do we have to end up shooting the film, the, the end of the film at the beginning? And I was of course pushing against that from an acting point of view, uh, that would have been hugely um, uh, uh, like challenging to, to kind of, especially, um, you know, actually for both Carrie and for Rafe, the place that they're at at the end of the movie is so hugely different. And it is through their getting know to know each other that, that they get to the place that they get to. And, and it would have been a real undermining of that if we shot it right at the beginning. I think we were able to push it to, you know, maybe halfway, two thirds of the way through that we had to shoot the, you know, the, the stuff in the, in the empty boat. Because Maria, of course, wanted that to be the stuff that we sh shot first because she could then fill all of this earth in. So it was a logistical, you know, nightmare from, from Mike, Maria, Redmond Morris, our, our co-producer who, who, was, who was trying to get the schedule together. It was really, um, very challenging um, and of course you're trying to protect the performances as much as you can but you realize you've got this set that is trying to tell you in what order it wants to be shot and Maria was really really inventive in how she found solutions to making sure it looked amazing while also uh, you know sharing my concerns about looking after the actors. What were the most, for, for each of you, I'll start with you, Gabby, what was the most um, challenging um, and pleasurable um, part of the shoot for you? Well, when we got to actually be shooting, <laughs> um, I would say, well, the weather was pretty extraordinary. I mean, we had, you had a little mini hurricane um, and, you know, rain was, there was a lot of mud, a lot of rain, waiting for the light. Um, and, um, but it was just an amazing group of people. And, you know, that thing of also being in a way on this excavation, which is what we were, because here we were in this field where we sort of created this, this thing and we were actually experiencing it and doing it on a daily basis. So that was quite special. You don't have that many experiences like that um, making films. Rafe, it looks very convincing. Um, how how close did you get in work with a, an archaeologist to um, look, to talk about technique and to make sure that it was authentic and, and convincing? Well, it helped that we. Uh, I was keen. I think Simon and Gabby were too. That we we got the archaeology absolutely right. So we had on site for all the scenes that were on about the dig about the ship. We had an archaeological advisor there every day. So. I, I was constantly, and Simon, we were asking, is this right? Is this what we would be doing? How am I handling this right? Um, and he was very helpful. But before that, I managed to get a little experience on a dig, actually in Suffolk, weirdly close to a place that I know. Um, someone said, oh, there's a little dig going on in a field. It wasn't, any, it, was any, it wasn't anything exciting, but I did see the care with which people were excavating you know, clearing sand and grit away. And it's very, it's very methodical and it's very detailed. And it's, um, so yes, we, we tried to get that, 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 that right. Uh, um, and I think, and researching Basil was fantastic thrill because he was the most extraordinary. The film only shows a bit of what this extraordinary man was. He'd actually published a whole book. He's a self-taught essentially from a working class agricultural back background, left school at 12 years old. I had a fascination with um, astrology and wrote a book about the history of astrological charts, which he published before 1930, before this happened in his life. It's a beautifully printed edition, incredibly well researched. This is a man who was not part of any kind of academia. He worked out of a village in Suffolk, but taught himself rudimentary German, French, and Latin to communicate with people dealing with these charts. Then he had published this book. So his knowledge, his ability to absorb, his, they say he could, I mean, it's a slightly maybe a, a cliche, but I mean, they, he could read the land. He could tell what the land was like, what the soil was like, what, what, what the land might yield. Um, and so I think he, he was a fascinating, it was very rewarding uh, to go to the British Museum, for instance, and they showed me, they have, 
Basil's books. They have his exercise books in which he wrote and drew. So it was very, I love the things where you hold the actual book that the man wrote himself and turn the pages and you see his own drawings. Uh, I, I found that. Um, I found the, everything about Basil profoundly affecting and moving. Um, and also someone who I think was incredibly humble and self-effacing and um, just just believed in doing the job right. And um, so that was, that was one of the challenges and one of the pleasures at the same time. And Kerry, did you do any, um, any research like that for Edith or, or the time period? Well, interestingly, the time period was sort of part of the reason I found the I'd sort of been living a little bit in that world because the year before, not the the summer before we shot this, I had been, I'd done a documentary about my grandfather um, called My Grandfather's War. And I'd followed him from the small mining village that he grew up in in Carmarthenshire to Japan, where he was a radar officer on a, um, on a ship. And so I'd sort of been living a little bit in that sort of pre-war, um, particularly sort of coming from a place of, you know, starting in a place of absolutely like a, a tiny sort of um, tight knit community, uh, never having left Wales to suddenly seeing the whole world. And so I was sort of, it was all in the, slightly in the back of my mind. Um, and um, yeah, Edith was, was incredibly well traveled. Um, she traveled all over the world with her family. Um, you know, her life was kind of very, um, she had a, a sort of tragic um, background, losing her husband who she'd, we, you know, I think it was important for us to kind of compress a lot of her real time frame to sort of balance out because the true Edith would have been sort of 56 when she died. So this is the very much the part of the, in fact, the only part I think of the whole thing that is the part where we've kind of slightly um, adapted it. Um, but, um, but yeah, she was, I think what, what was so moving for me was that this was someone who lived a really uh, exciting, adventurous, rich life. And, and I think there's a part of her that's really longing for that. And a huge part of her attraction to the mounds and to the possibility of what lies underneath them is that it will bring her back into that part of her life where she was somebody who saw the world and um, mm. there was a lot of interesting, exciting, beautiful things. and. Um, and things that she shared, and it was a passion that she shared with her with her husband. He, they were the one they together had decided that they wanted to investigate these mounds, and then he passed away. So I think you know this is a part of her trying to sort of get back the part of her life where she was um, able to see things and do things. And I think her circumstances have kind of closed her down quite a lot. But you know she was a nurse in the First World War um, for the Red Cross. You know she was somebody who gave out as well to the community hugely. And um, you know, she paid her staff. I think when she passed away, I believe she left her the majority of her fortune to the staff that were so faithful to her, who she lived with. So she was really um, quite an extraordinary woman. And she, what, she gave up being a, night, a dame. <laughs> she was. She yeah, was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's the letter where she she yeah. turns it down. Yeah. Why did she turn well, it down? I went to Sutton Hoo, which was quite fun as well. Yeah. Started filming. Went on a little research trip. And lay on the mounds, didn't we, Rafe? We did. Um, and Kerry, what was the most pleasurable um, part of the shoot for you? Gosh, I mean, it was all pleasurable. The most, uh, uh, the most terrifying was burying Rafe Fines and trying to rescue him. <laughs> we did not use a stunt double. Rafe was really buried under all of that mud, and we really had to get him out because if we didn't, he might genuinely choke off some dirt. So that was kind of um tightrope stuff which i felt yeah very kerry <laughs> kerry kept saying to me before the take simon i don't like this i don't, I don't... Like it. <laughs> <laughs> I found it so no i didn't want to be in the newspaper having been the person who took down <laughs> Rafe fines like it's not, it's not the way. it was yeah that was terrifying because rafe was underneath there and he really was his whole face was covered and we had to sort of dig him out as it time to this camera coming down and discovering his face and I think we were all scared out of our minds that we'd get it wrong. So the, that felt very real. I mean, and that's part, what, you know, so much of the film 
is the sort of most fun way to act because you really are Simon really did put us in so many situations that we had you know for everybody I wasn't you know obviously involved in the actual digging but getting to sit amongst the dig and the cameras just rolling and suddenly like somebody's found something and they actually have found it because Simon's buried it in there and they've they've discovered it and you know and the camera's coming around and catching everyone's reactions so it was so immersive in such a fun way and that that was that was really special you don't really get to do that very much right and Simon for you the most pleasurable and terrifying moments um the well the most pleasurable moments were watching there's something so extraordinary about making movies uh that when you see something happen in front of you um you know, unless there's been, there's been some kind of huge digital uh, screw up that you've got it, it's there, it's in there. And accruing those moments day after day after day, you, you know, it's also terrifying because you go, only I can ruin this now because, you know, these performances are so extraordinary. And you and that's such an inspiring thing. And I think it, I think it does make you more of a perfectionist the more you just get these moments of extraordinary vulnerability and, and, and surprising uh, uh, turns of characters that, that you couldn't, although, you know, I was provoking the actors to give me um, unpredictable moments, um, you know, it's, it's, you can't ever expect that you'll get the performances that we ended up getting in, in this film. And, and, you know, you just enjoy, you, you know, we had a lot of trouble editing the, 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 the cutting it down the film because there were so many brilliant things we had to get rid of. Um, so uh, that was, you know, that, that, that's infinitely pleasurable and why I started working in the business in the first place. Um, the terrifying moments are when it's, you know, minus two degrees and someone's having to stand in the middle of the night under a rain machine. So it's minus two degrees, but we're turning the rain on and Rafe is standing there in his shirt sleeves uh, because it's supposed to be raining. Uh, and and it's, it's a summer rain that you can't react to in the way that you would if it was minus two degrees. But all of those weather moments where every single actor is having to pretend that it's the, a hot summer's day um, uh, in the circumstance, you know, just from, da from a date's point of view, a logistical point of view, we were just pushed back to, to, to a time of the year. And it was really great that we made the movie when we made it because we had the team that we had and it was the right time to go. But it meant that the actors were really taking it on the chin in terms of how much they had to keep pretending. Um, which, of course, that scared me because I wanted them to not have to really do as much pretending as that. <laughs> Well, Rafe, I'm very glad you survived this shoot. It sounds like uh, Simon did his best um, to take <laughs> you out. But congratulations to all of you on an absolutely beautiful film. And thank you so much to Netflix um, and to all of our guests for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.